without further ado, um, I'll hand you over to uh, Raj Tulsiani. Raj. Good morning, everybody. A happy new year and a very big welcome uh, to the latest in our series of race network leaders and future events, um, future leader events. I'm Raj Tulsiani, CEO of Green Park and today's chair. Along with Javid, I'm also the co-founder of Race Equality Matters. Thanks for joining us. It's fantastic to have so much support. Um, I think there's people from our from Green Parks, Bristol, Birmingham, Manchester offices. Javid, and Birmingham is way south from Nottingham. <laughs> way south. I mean, that's like, you know, an hour and a bit. Okay, so um, today's theme is how to influence and engage key stakeholders. And I can see just by looking through the chat, there's some... Now, already some good questions about you know how do we create those levers where either it's a win-win for the organization or people who may ha now have the will don't have the skill come to us with lived experience to ensure what they do lands because what we see is lots of people doing the right things but it's just not landing in the hearts and mind and operational procedures so this is really all about change management and to support that we've got two good uh, external speakers Hugo Ebo from Virgin Money and our old friend and uh, supporter, Dr. Carl George, MBE. Um, there'll also be two collaborative discussion groups. You'll hear um, about how you can continue to collaborate um, after the event, but Javid and I and other parts of the network are all on LinkedIn, and we're using some other social media platforms to do some action learning sets. There will be a short Q&A and a final poll, and we'll aim to close for 11.15. So before we start a bit of housekeeping, uh, we'll be recording this event for you to access later on and share with your networks if needs be. Um, if you have any questions along the way, please do put them in the chat. Your sound will be auto disabled until the discussion groups. Please feel free to tweet and post and do all other kind of amplification uh, actions if you're liking the event. You'll see our handles on the right hand side of the slide. Uh, and do let other people know about what we're trying to do here. You know, as a bare principle, what we're trying to do here is empower existing actions. So we don't take money out of anyone's pockets. This is all done for free um, to individuals. We're just trying to find things that are really working and action those and show that this is how it works over here. This is how you can utilize that in your own situation. And it's really important to us that people with lived experience are absolutely part of that internal solution. So... For those who don't, for those who may not have been to one of our events before, um, I'll just give you a minute on um, race equality matters. So Javin and I created race equality matters in response to what we're calling the moment 18 months ago during the summer of 2020. We didn't want to look back and see that in the end it was just another moment or missed opportunity where um, people amplified their corporate intentions around change and nothing happened or tokenistic. Black screens were used as a, um, an end game around to say how much we care about things. You know, really what we're interested in doing here is to create meaningful change. And part of that has to be for the ethnic minorities and allies in organizations for their voices to become more integral in decision making and the governance of diversity and inclusion. So we wanted to capture the energy of the people and race networks that we already knew. So we created Race Quality Matters as a not for profit. Um, as those of you who joined before will know, you know, this is not about more talking or PR gesturing or helping organizations tick their boxes. It's about sharing and co-creating solutions that lead to meaningful action um, that leads to things that can be measured as positive impacts. It exists to enable change and in particular to provide proactive tools and reactive support and resources for race networks and those looking to drive and tackle equality. And of all of our groups, this race network group, for me, is one of the most personally important because I feel organizations and allies are now going to the race chair, but every time there's a chair in many organizations, the strategy changes, or there isn't that governance in terms of reference to make sure that what we're doing is integral to any spend, any um, structuring, any, governance of decisions around diversity and inclusion as a core business capability. So we've already created five impactful solutions in collaboration with those with lived experience around race equality. And the great news 
is that over the past few months, we've spoken to many organizations. I believe there's already 3,000 organizations actively engaged with us um, that are implementing these um, products, uh, free products, uh, to drive change and move the dial on race inequality. And of course, not everyone starts in the same position, not everyone has an idea of their own diversity and maturity. But ultimately, you know, we're taking feedback from these solutions and they're making a real positive impact. So our solutions so far include Race Equality Week, which is always the, which this week year is the 7th to the 13th um, of February. It's just over three weeks away. We'll let you know more about that later. Uh, and the, the kind of campaigning hashtag this year is, you know, I suppose determined by many of the people in these groups already, uh, which is hashtag action, not just words. And we see that even in organizations where they really, really are on the front foot, and there are a handful of trailblazing organizations that are doing great work that we share, you know, they often have now the will, but not the internal skill to actually impact the day-to-day -day experiences of ethnic minorities within their organization and within their service users and customers. So the first, uh, the next product is Safe Space, which is a facilitated, di facilitated dialogue between three and five ex-co senior management board members and up to 10 minority colleagues. It provides the environment that enables brave conversations, facilitates uncomfortable topics in a way where there's no kind of finger pointing and recriminations and in some organizational cultures, limitations of people's careers. Uh, but it's also structured in a way that it um, drives meaningful action. And mental health uh, first aid were real key collaborators on this because we saw that when, um, particularly after the Floyd George murder, the lots of ethnic minorities were sort of being asked to fix race in their organization because there's this knee jerk reaction and it's having a significant effects on their well-being. So we collaborated, collaborated with Mental Health First Aid to make sure that part of this was to create that safe space for the ethnic minorities to challenge the organisation, but also for the organisation to be more accountable. Um, the next product is The Big Promise, which is all about turning words into action, involving the wider workforce. So in a nutshell, you can choose from what we call seven magnificent promises. Um, which uh, have been determined by our networks and those with lived experience of race equality that have been helping us. Um, we believe they'll make a real impact. As a leader or an individual or an ally, you share your promise to encourage transparency and accountability, and then you deliver on it. So there are a different set of promises depending where you are sitting in the organisation. Um, and for leaders, it's a real case of them to say, well, we're not going to do everything. We're not going to bore the ocean. Now, as a leader, my focus is on achieving these things. And because they are structured, because we record them by industry, we can then say in financial services, these are the things that leaders are setting up to. In passenger transport, and some of the best work in this country has been done by HS2 and Network Rail, which I'm glad to say have been long-term supporters, you know, they can say this is what we're focusing. And others who are perhaps less mature in their diversity journey can can prioritize off the back of that. Um, tea break or safe space tea break um, is a product where an organization theme, uh, an organization wide theme discussion, which enables you to hear the honest voice and feelings of your colleagues across the organization and take action. And this was co created with, as I said, Network Rails, who do some great work in their cultural fusion network. Um, and we felt this was a great solution for race networks to implement simply because otherwise someone's going to pay 10 grand to a facilitator to come and tell you what you already know and you won't be in control of it. And it's much better that we're putting ourselves in a position where our influence and lived experience is really important in terms of future governance of these changes. And um, finally, um, uh, we've recently launched a solution called My Name Is which is all about making sure we say other people's names correctly. Um, our how to do it right guide shows how to do this, including spelling our names phonetically on emails and other communication channels. We're working on an AI to put on our site that will allow our members to come on and get the proper pronunciations of people's names. Um, and then uh, I think we all know the effect and microaggressions can have, particularly around you know, people's real names not being pronounced or over a period of years being 
put into a nickname that we don't particularly want. So I think this, again, is a free way of an organisation showing that they're willing to do something and hopefully a much more of a, a door opener to um, dealing with some of these microaggressions than buying external uh, consultancy when actually the problems haven't been probably isolated and identified internally. So um, next slide, please. Uh, before I pass over to Javed, um, I would like to say a big thank you to our partners who, along with my firm Green Park, are funding Rose Quality Matters, um, especially our lifetime visionary partner, British Telecom, and our founding partners at the Data and Marketing and Association and HS2. Their support means that no individual will ever have to pay to access our resources and events. You know, this is a not-for-profit that we run off a shoestring, taking good practice from all over the world and providing how-to guides to people who either think like us or can benefit from the learning and thinking that we're access, we can access. We are an NFP. We are very keen indeed to further uh, our campaign. We think we'll touch 3 million people this year, um, but we need funding to keep going. So you can help us to by running your Race Equality Week, um, to create more solutions with us, to run events like today. Um, so if you'd like to find out more about how you can help, we would be delighted to discuss it and, and, and need the support. So we're expecting over 100 separate organisations today. The majority of attendees are race network leads, uh, race network champions. We also have um, a good smattering of allies and including some other interesting parties like HR and diversity inclusion representatives. So we've got quite a good mix of collaboration, which I hope comes out in the focus groups. The Race Equality Matters Network now has over 1,000 race network leads and members, and those numbers continue to grow. Um, and we've created this event series because many of you have told us that you would like a collaborative space where you can learn, collaborate and share ideas, network, be inspired and be empowered. And, and for those of you who are interested, we'd also like to um, talk to you about a particular coaching and development product that we, we're building, um, specifically at creating more leadership through the Race Network leads and the Race Network members. So to really do something proactively about building our own pipeline of leadership through people who share these values and, and lived experiences. So please hit me up on LinkedIn or or anything like that, if you're interested in taking part of that, we'll end up in some free coaching, but we are trying to build something that organizations have to use to um, put their money where their mouth is. So before you hear from, my, uh, from our first speaker, we're going to start, as we always do in these things, with a quick poll. Okay, so at the moment, about... 80% of us are ethnic minorities, 20% um, allies, great. Um, over half of us are race network leads, um, about 25% diversity and inclusion uh, professionals, and only 5% HR. So again, quite interesting, um, particularly against yesterday's group, which is much more significant, that 30% HR. Um, how well do you think your organisation tackles race equality? Well, there's quite a broad smattering there in the middle, isn't there? So not enough, 36%, a little 27%, fairly well, 31%. Interesting, no one's saying really well, and very, very few people say not at all. So it's really about marginal returns and you know, making things slightly more impactful. Um, and making sure they land with us as well, that they're not just done for marketing and PR reasons. Um, have you noticed much change within your organisations uh, tackling race inequality in the last 12 months? Um, the majority here, 34% a little, 34% a fair amount. So I think that's incredibly encouraging. You know, that's, that's good. Let's make sure that it's not something that, you know, gets hidden behind social mobility or, you know, tries to be folded in something else. Because, of course, we've got a long way to go, particularly in terms of pay gaps and equality in organisations. Um, do you feel your leaders and managers are committed, committed to tackling race equality? So about half a yes, 20% um, and no, and 30% are unsure. 
Do you feel your leaders are confident in talking about race? Um, I think this is quite interesting. Interesting. There's 19% who are comfortable, 38% who are a little bit, a um, little bit confident, and the majority, and uh, not really confident. 28%. So again, a big change from even six months ago. There. Uh, does your race network have a senior sponsor? Only 62% have a senior sponsor. I think that's incredible. So if you haven't, then, then you need to ask why not. And, you know, maybe that's a, it would be great if there's more HR people here, actually, because they would probably give us a good reason um, as, a, as a profession as opposed to an individual organisation. Does your race network encourage allies to join? 77% say yes. Uh, nine percent of you don't have networks so still some work to do there and then find um almost a penultimate question do you feel your network has influence in your organization 22 percent not enough um 31 a little and 28 percent a good amount so again quite a significant improvement from just six months ago and then why have you joined today's event to get back to the important bit benefits to you uh, the vast majority here is to learn and then, you know, around 50 percent to be inspired. Well, I can't promise that uh, to collaborate. We should be able to do that and to network. We'll, we'll definitely do that. So that's the end of the poll. OK, so th th thank you, Raj. So um, before we hear from um, Ugo Ibo um, from Virgin Money, uh, we wanted to share a short video from Dr. Carl George MB and which you created for this event series. Um, for those that um, attended the last event, he shared some of his um, expertise. And uh, Carl is a thought leader and internationally established consultant in governance. He is a managing director of the Governance Forum, working with boards and senior executives in private, public, and voluntary sectors. He has over 20 years experience combined across accountancy, business, and strategic development. Uh, for those um, that haven't seen it yet, he did launch the Race Equality Code 2020, and we recommend you have a look at that, uh, and has worked with organisations in a ho host of sectors to examine their commitment and actions on EDI and indeed race. Um, so for those that attended the last session, he shared his expertise on creating impactful terms of reference and how to be an effective chair. Uh, and you can access this uh, on our website. Um, today, Carl's going to do um, address the question you've all been asking about. Um, two areas of key support um, around authority and decision making as a race network lead. A lot of um, people who end up becoming um, chairs of race networks or any other ERG group um, is voluntary role. Quite often they may not have as enough experience of being a chair. Um, so how do people go about building these skills? Because they're quite crucial to make that work succeed. Yeah, you're right, David, about getting those skills, particularly if it's the first time you've been a chair. Um, how do we develop? And some of this is going to sound very basic, but it really does work. I talked about authority. Where do you get that authority from? You see, it's being prepared. It's making sure that you've got the information before the meeting. And I've observed some really good chairs. What you don't know that's happening behind the scenes is that they've been briefed really well by a company secretary or a chief executive. Mm -hmm. And they've had meetings with executive team in advance of the meeting. So they're really clued up on the agenda. That authority it comes from the preparation so make sure you're prepared and practice practice the running of the meeting in advance of the meeting just like you'd practice in any other area if we were doing public speaking go through the agenda try and find out what the key things you think are going to come up and then rehearse them with your colleagues by asking questions by making sure you've got the answers that you want to get even before the meeting all of that will give you the confidence to be authoritative in the meeting and although you're a first among e equals in the chairing situation you still got to have and what I mean by that is you're no higher than anybody else in the group you're just facilitating discussions 
But a lot of the time, you are going to have to make a decision on behalf of the group. And you are going to say, like, this is my opinion and this is the way I want us to go. All of that comes in that authority. Another thing you can do is actually observe, actively observe other chairs. Mm. So don't just be in the meeting as a part of the meeting. And you can also go online and look at meetings that are publicly online in a number of um, different organisations like the NHS. Um, we'll make sure you've got meetings that are chaired that you can get in the public domain. So have a look at good chairs and also poor chairs and see what they're doing wrong and make sure that you don't do the same things. A couple of clues and hints. Timekeeping, mm. not letting people dominate meetings so therefore you're able to bring other people in when people are taking over your agenda. Have an agenda that you want to make sure that you keep to and just being on time. And then the final one I'd probably say, apart from shadowing and studying good chairs, is making sure you get good at taking decisions. Guess how you do that? Making decisions. You see, you've got to practice that muscle of summarising what the discussion was, um, articulating that back to the group, and then putting your stance on it and saying, right, this is what we decided, group. This is what we're going for. And then making sure you get the buy-in from everybody so we can move on. So hopefully there are a few little tips there to help you to develop your chairing skills. I can ask one um, last question on that, actually, you, um, about making decisions. And sometimes you're in the discussions and there isn't a clear, obvious answer. There's two sides to a story or two ways we can go. How do you, especially if you're um, relatively new to chairing, how do you um, manage, let's say, making a decision that makes you feel uncomfortable? Yes. Um, so that's a really good question about what do we do about decisions which mean that you're uncomfortable because it may be 50-50 sometimes. Mm. You're not 100% sure what is the right decision. And link back to what I said about just making decisions. The one thing the chair should have that most of the other members of the group may not have is that overall purpose and vision of the group. It's that interaction with all of the members of the group individu individually that you've done before the meeting, that you've done in the meeting. It's making sure that you've looked through the overall picture of what this whole group is trying to achieve. You should be more in, um, invested in the whole process. And this is where you've got to have that confidence to say, actually, I'm the person who's spoken to everyone individually or most of the people. I'm the person who's reviewed the agenda. We know where we're going. I'm the person who's got that casting vote almost to say, this is the way we're going. And then you're going to have to take that bold decision of saying, right, I'm going to be accountable for this and I'm going to make that decision on behalf of our group. If you have built up that respect and you've built up that confidence, you've built that authority, even if you get it wrong, because you may get things wrong, you'll have the group which have said we've deliberated, mm. we can see how you've come up with that decision, and we will support you in that decision. Mm. And then the most important thing then is to make that decision and mm. work it through. But chairs make mistakes. Yeah. Um, we do things wrong. Yeah. We do need to make decisions wrong. Great, thank you. So, um, as we said, these events are interactive. So in a second or in a minute, we're going to go into collaborative discussion groups. Um, and the discussion will be when you've experienced a chair or leader that's authority and is great as decision making, what did they do? So um, we'll all feed back to that so we can get their own little crib list of what works. So I was in a um, um, fascinating group there. I think, yeah, a lot of us have experienced quite typically, you know, poor chair chairmanship, etc. Um, so what um, I'm going to suggest is um, if everyone for the next 20, 30 seconds, just go into the chat and write what they see as a good chair. So what does a good chair do? Um, and then what we'll do is we'll collate this and we'll share we, this with you later in the week. Um, our key guest today, uh, and I'm delighted to introduce um, Ugo Ibo, um, who has worked at Virgin Money for seven years. Um, um, if we could have the screen on um, Ugo now. Um, Ugo's career um, at Virgin Money is spanned across commercial and risk functions and is currently the cultural and cap capability lead within digital engineering. Prior to working at Virgin Money, he had spent 10 years at MBNA credit cards. His interest around inclusion came through his cross-cultural experience in childhood 
being brought up by his white foster parents whilst interspersing time in his natural home of African heritage in Birmingham. Ugo found um, the interplays between the two cultures, African England and black and white, fascinating, yet at times difficult to maneuver around. Now that interest is generated into a more meaningful input, um, output, resulting in Ugo becoming one of the co-chairs of the Virgin Money Embrace Network, and a lot, a lot of networks now call themselves Embrace, which is great. Um, and having felt personally affected by the recent um, Black Lives Matter movement, he's keen to see the business truly become a bank that stands for something. So a very huge um, um, good morning and welcome to Ugo. Thank you for joining us today. No, it's good to be here. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, lovely. Thank you. Um, brilliant. It, it's weird when you hear yourself introduced like that, isn't it? <laughs> it's it's yeah, strange. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you couldn't make it up, could you, Ugo? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. well, thank you. So um, from an earlier conversation we had, and we've really enjoyed talking to you in the build up to this, um, I understand that as a co-chair of the Embrace Network, you've been instrumental in turning it around. What wasn't working in the past and what did you do and that would you cite as key success factors to make it work now? Yeah, I'd say I say there are three key things, and I'll, I'll step into each one. But first, I need to say apologies for completely taking everybody's poll off earlier. I had a button in front of me that said "end poll," which I thought was to close the poll. There you go; it was me. Um, um, secondly, I, I need I need to be really, really transparent. So when I talk about co-chair, it wasn't just me that was instrumental. There was there was four of us that were really key in driving forward our network, um, and and it was it was hard work. So I mean, I'll, I'll say that up front. One of the first things is to recognise that it was, it was a particular season that our organisation was going through. Um, we were merging two companies, Verge Money and Clydesdale Bank. Um, so it was a bit of a takeover, but we were merging the networks. Um, of course, obviously, a lot of focus was on the merge. We weren't getting the level of support that we needed, really, at the, at the top level. Um, and we were struggling, really, with to engage our exec sponsor. It was... We're constantly having to kind of provide a golden bullet. What's the golden bullet? Why do we need to do this? Why is it important? So we all got to the stage where we nearly wanted to quit. Um, so we got to 2019 and we were like, right, we're going to give this one last try. And it was really interesting to hear the, the video before with Carl, because it was that kind of approach. It was like, right, we're going to give it one last try. We're going to set ourselves up quite strategically. Um, I'm, as you heard from my intro, I'm a, I'm a strategy analyst by trade. So strategy is key to me, focused attention, pre-planning that's all my kind of BAU and my day stay and I'll talk a little bit about why that's important for you guys as well but um we set ourselves to look at four key areas how we engage our externally our external organizations how we liaise with our senior leadership team how we liaise with our members and get understanding of what they want and our ethnic minority colleagues and how do we just also have fun how do we celebrate and you know you know, think about religious festivals and things like that. How do we celebrate everything that is to do with race and ethnicity? So the four of us took a strand each and we used that as our strategy. And we, and you know, we, we went into the 2020, early 2020, it was going really well. And then we all know what happened then. We, we, we hit COVID, we hit Black Lives Matter, and then everything popped off. And what was really key is that we'd taken that strategic approach. And then from Black Lives Matter, our senior leaders, our board, our execs, they all wanted to kind of think, right, what do we as an organization do? And because we had that strategy in place, it really made our engagement with them a lot easier. We were able to give some really clear ideas. Okay, this is what we want to achieve as a network. Here's how you can support. They would then give their experience, their thoughts into that. And it just gave us a real good focus to how to really shift the dial on sort of ethnicity, representation, and support in the organization that we are. One of the key phrases our exec sponsor used was the word, agitator we were able to give her the tools to be a real agitator in the business um just like a senior and you said what were the four strands so external focus senior leader engagement your members and colleagues what do they need and understanding who they are and then sort of celebration having fun brilliant yeah thank you and i think um in, in the previous thing what carl said it was about having that clear, clear purpose uh, and also terms of reference what's the purpose of this group and as you said when you got the level it, it's much more strategic and aligned so um, um echoing what's been working out there thank you what activity has the network been involved in and what impact has it had so we we are now down to three chairs we had the four one step away to, to focus on other things so we've got the three chairs and one of the biggest things that we did recently was expand our, our what i'd call a committee and i'm using real strong phrases like committee structure strategy and you know you talked about your tors your terms of references because 
that's the mindset that we went in with and continue to go with, which is what's seen us deliver some really powerful things. So we expanded our committee to have like a subcommittee of 10 people with each person having a key focus on one area. So one of those, one might be focused on learning and development okay so we have a bank wide learning and development platform how is that focused on ethnicity one of them would be working on communities what are we doing in the communities around us so each person had a particular focus um raising awareness of the network delivering roadshows to the different departments within the bank there's some of the key activities and the subcommittee was really key to kind of driving that so each person had one focus because for a lot of people this is side of desk each person has one focus to kind of drive that forward and get there and then you start stepping into what I would call is kind of validity. You put some validity behind your network and then people are interested in what your point of view is, what you have to say. And then you see your in network influence increase. So we have, we kind of influence business decisions and even some of the direction that businesses take. So we meet with our board members twice a year and we kind of articulate and deliver what we want to see, what our strategic objective is. And that kind of influences their decisions in the wider field of the whole bank. We get to work with our brand and marketing, we kind of go through all the materials, say, well, that's not very diverse. This isn't quite diverse. You know, you talked about my little bio at the beginning. I was able to kind of articulate how amazing it is that we see black representation in males, but it's always very much with a white female. And coming from a mixed family myself, that I know how kind of divisive that can be to black females. And actually it's very rare you see a black family as a whole and the kind of impacts that has. And you know, you change the mindset of people within your whole business where actually key areas there. And you know, we were able to, to deliver a career sponsorship program working with our recruitment team and um, where we've got 30 ethnic minority colleagues who are able to go on this career program, drive forward their own careers and expand. You know, we have a great catch ups with our HR. So we, we get our HR strategy versus our ethnicity strategy. We drive the two together. We can able to deliver some great things. And then we hold some brilliant events, which I'll talk on in a little bit in a minute. Yeah, thank you. I think what, what's shining there and only a few organizations we're aware of this is where it's become part of the business and so the business comes to, to you know it shows i think the value the validity you know the, the power of it and i think it's because of the strategic and the earlier work you had done and i think that's what we're trying to share with other networks is, you know if you can get into that position then you become part of the business and, and a real um asset so thank you for, for, for sharing that and as i said we, we are videoing this so people can access um what we has been saying later and do share with your other uh, members in your networks um yeah and just on, and just just on that time, and, and, and I know we're short of time, but if I think about the concept of the validity piece, it's really key. Think about your, a lot of you, this is side of desk, right? So just think about your day-to-day -day role. Who are the people that you have respect for? Who are the people that you invest time with? Who are the people that come to you and when they say something, you, you listen, you hear it. It's those that have kind of built up that rapport. It's those that have built up that validity. Those people where you've seen tangible results. So when they say something, you know they can either deliver on it or they're going to do it. These networks are no different. And in fact, it's bringing that day-to-day -day into these side of desk kind of roles that really drives things forward. So in effect, it's professionalizing it, isn't it? Correct. Yeah, yeah. Um, the, the Embrace Network has many allies as members. Um, what benefits and impact have you seen as a result of this? It's a, a great question. Um, so I talked a little bit about the events slightly before. We've done some in some some strong events. We've we've had people like John Barnes and Shaka Hislop and Nita Asante coming and talk to us about racism in football. It's quite funny because they, well, it wasn't funny actually, they came to us and we did a session on taking the knee and racism in football just mm -hmm. before the Euros. And then everyone knows what happened at the end of the England mm -hmm. Euros. It was like everything we just talked about two months prior happened there and then. So that was quite powerful. But um, we started an allyship program um, called Getting Comfortable with the Uncomfortable, which has been one of our other kind of flagship events that we've done and what we do is the program is interviewing ethnic minority colleagues on different topics and it's basically getting our one of our committee members who is who is an ally who's not ethnic minority she's white and she asks those really uncomfortable questions yeah. that we just know so many of our allies would like to ask want to know yeah. understand more and that has generated a lot of interest because allies are coming they get into so i even pre-asked the question so we you know the questions that they get asked to the ethnic minorities are delivered they get to talk about some of the things listen to the q a at the end engage with that and you just see so many of our allies really key and interested in that i mean i'll be really honest with you we've got a three to four percent population of ethnic minorities in our bank mm. so you know 95 six seven percent of our workforce are allies so we can't just be so siloed and thinking about our ethnic minorities only whilst it is important that we are delivering for them 
allies make a big big part of that because at the end of the day they are creating the environment for the three to four percent you know how do you gain them well you give them lived experiences from the good to the bad i talked about fun before a really great example is one of our colleagues shared about haribo going vegan because that suddenly meant that a whole load of muslims within our organization can enjoy haribo sweets so all those allies that have been bringing in their party sweets for however many years suddenly realize that actually mm. i can involve all my colleagues in this and so that impact with your allies is really key because they create that environment for your ethnic minority colleagues Brilliant, fantastic. And related to the sort of discussion group we just had, what skills um, have you had to develop as a co-chair and how did you develop them? So I was in the session, maybe it's probably the same one that Carl was in before when we did that, when he did that video. And I think the lady that was on used the phrase CEO and you do, I, I, it's a brilliant phrase and, and I've taken it on board. It's stuck in my head. You have to see yourself as a CEO. This is side desk. This is you know, you're doing this probably on top of your day job, probably doing in some extra hours for some people. For some people, it's their paid job and great, but for a lot of people, it's not. But you have to think like a CEO. You have to think about your purpose, your terms of reference, your strategy. It's everything that Carl talked about, being prepared, pre preempting your sessions, going into meetings with some kind of thought about what is the agenda? What is the minimum standard that I need to come out of this meeting with? And then facilitating that exact environment. And, you know, I love the concept we had before where you say is go and study good and bad meetings. In your day-to-day -day job, you will have good and bad meetings. Why was it bad? What were you seeing that didn't work? Why was it good? What were you seeing that did work? What does that leader or that influencer or that chair do in the meeting of operational workforce or in the meeting of strategic design for the business? You know, nothing to do with DNI. What do they do that's good? And they were the kind of skills I was able to build up myself. Um, because of it, I then got recognized for a future business leader course, where they got to learn even more kind of skills such as resilience, growth mindset, all those key pieces that as a chair, they're really important because otherwise your network won't flow and your network won't grow. So that they were kind of, I just, I'd echo everything that Carl talked about in that video. Think of yourself as a CEO. And the last thing I'll probably finish with, I know that DNI is seen as sometimes quite an emotive, touchy feely concept. And that is great. And it should, that should never be lost. But if you overlay some strategy and some kind of focus and real clarity over the top of that, it becomes more powerful and more potent than anything else you can deliver. Absolutely. Thank you. And I think it was important is that you know, look outside the, you know, the everyday life and your, your business, what, what functions are going really well. And then just bring that, you know, cut and paste, I call it, you know, bring it into the, how to run them, run them, them networks. Absolutely. Fantastic. So thank you for your time. Ugo. Um, engaging and influencing senior leaders and allies is key to making a significant difference. So I think, you know, the, the, you call it, it's not a side, the race network shouldn't be a side project. They should be part of the business. So, so but you need to influence, you know, the, the allies in that. So what we're going to do is go into quick um, collaboration groups. Um, how do you engage senior leaders, allies and make a significant difference? Welcome back, everyone. I think um, some people found that one uh, a bit more challenging. Um, um, and I guess that's the purpose of this, so we can learn from each other. Um, again, just for 20 seconds, for those that feel they can, if you can just put, you know, a one or a two liner of how you go about or engaging senior leaders and allies or how it can be done again what we'll do is we'll capture all this and then share it with everyone you know after the event um, um i think one thing that did come up we did say is find one key stakeholder or one ally and i think um um ugo mentioned you know we got a, a, a lady that was a um, you know white but really ag agitator find one person if you look at videos from our last event again it was all about one person and keep it simple do one thing um so it, if you can put the stuff in the chat, that'd be fantastic. Um, so what, we come to the final part. Um, what, um, if we go to the next slide, please, Nish. Okay, so to carry on the conversation and collaborating, we've created a, a network on the Guild. It's free for yourselves, um, where there, there, I think there's over 50 people there already from the networks, where we talk about, you can talk about things or raise questions, raise issues of people sharing terms of reference or whatever. So do go on there. There, there are fellow people like yourselves um, on it and, it, and it's free. And we'll, it's, there's a link in and we'll send it in the notes afterwards. Thank you. Next slide, please. 
um, race quality week um, people um, should know about. Um, I'm conscious of time, so I won't talk much more about this. Um, you can do your own thing, come to race quality virtual events like this or run a solution. Please do look at our solutions if you haven't. Um, they will help your network create change in your organization. Yeah, these have, these have been tried and tested. Uh, and uh, I know some people are at today's event who have used them and it's made a huge difference. Um, if you're doing something for, um, if you want to, your organization being a spotlight, um, do get in touch with us. So here, here's a few, on, there's Kelvin on there. Um, and what we just know, why is Race Equality Week important? Um, your organization's plans for Race Equality Week, just bullet points is fine. And then what you'll do, you get on our website and we'll do some social media. Um, this, this is part of our uh, um, spotlight page for Amy. Um, and, that, and it's got sort of um, a director talking as well. So, um, you know, that, that that's there. So we want to amplify what's happening. And on the right, you can see some organizations that have already shared their spotlights. Next slide, please. Okay, so if, um, before I hand you back to Raj to um, go into final Q&A, um, if we can just do a quick poll, please. So I'll hand you back to Raj now. Um, so Raj, you, you've got the steering wheel now. Okay, any questions in the chat, Jarvan? Okay, a good question someone asked, um, if you just bear with us, is, um, is your DNI part of your personal objectives in your company and organization? So um, maybe uh, Ugo can help with that one. Yeah, so um, it, it is. Um, and we've actually started to build out some targets that actually feed into all of our sort of senior leadership areas. So they, can, they have a target to get representation of ethnicity to a certain level, gender to a certain level, so that it flows into BAU. Because it's going to sound really horrible, let's be honest, unless it, it's hitting people where it hurts, i.e. their pocket. Some of these things don't get through. We talked a little bit about the golden bullet in our last session and how people always want to see that golden bullet. And until something really impacts them, it, it's a nice to have. So, yeah, we've started to flow it through. And as individuals, a lot of us have it in our personal goals and our main goals to try and change that whole kind of side of desk angle so actually that if i do a good job here and generate change here through this objective it's going to have some benefit for me so yeah i've noticed some organizations are now are having what we call chief diversity officers you know so actually you know it's become part of the organization so by default they'll, they'll start they'll have measure, you know, measurable targets um and uh part part of the business um another question is how do you um uh, encourage intersectionality across the networks is that for, for, for you, for Ugo? Uh, Ugo or Raj? Um, who... Ugo, do you want to go first? Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting one because when you go on this journey, you'll see there are some people who are really keen to kind of cross collaborate and there's some that aren't. Um, yeah. We were talking a little bit before about when you get your ethnicity agenda because you've done your amazing term of reference, you've got your perfect strategy that is ethnicity focused and then your HR team coming to you and say, I know Black Lives Matter, but all lives matter as well. I, I'm being really facetious there, but you get my point, right? So um, it is a difficult trait. Data is really key because you can kind of really target events to go, do you know what? We have a high population of Black females or Asian females. So let's put some real focus into that. Let's do a really key event. Um, I talked about shotgun versus Uzi, so real focused angle. Let's do something really key that focuses on this particular intersectionality because it is very difficult to share... If you think, depending on how many di different DNI networks you have, it's very difficult to share that kind of journey. So try and use data where you can to be really focused on where you're going to feel, because you're not going to be able to do every kind of intersectional angle. But just recognise that intersectionality does exist. Yeah, I mean, each organisation comes from a slightly different place and a slightly different level of diversity, maturity. Um, what we've seen work in this intersectionality piece is... To, to get them to think of it as any piece of change management. And most organizations have a staff or a practice management system, and they might only put one module in, but it's all constructed so it fits with everything else. So you then end up building one huge 85 foot tower of diversity interventions for white, well educated public school women. And then you're kind of doing something completely over here for black colleagues and something completely over here for black women colleagues. And in, in the end, there's 15 to 16 clubs that one person could be having affinity with. So what we always say is bring it into an area where it's actually creating a level of value and benefit for the whole business, but construct that with your race, race network and with people with lived experience and be really accountable for what you're actually doing. So don't try and boil the ocean, but do something that's constructed so it can fit well with everything else because 
most of this leads in some perspective to cultural change, which should make the organisation more inclusive, regardless of what your protected characteristic would be. But we're not all there yet, are we? Great. And I'll just add very quickly, I mean, we did something really simple last year, which was a hate crime event where we had somebody from Northumbria police come in and talk about hate crime. That covers every characteristic and even some of the yeah. characteristics that maybe aren't even brought into networks. So there were simple things you could do as well that are small and precise. Good point. Thank you. Um, I think it's Asraf has asked uh, an interesting question. Um, uh, Paul, you mentioned uh, Virgin Money are running development programme for ethnic group. Um, how do you measure the success on those that take part? Um, and has it been successful? It has been successful. And it's a great question because we we had to think different about what does good look like. And, you'll, and you know, I talked about the touchy feeling concept before. You'll find that with a lot of this. That it's not as simple as all of my ethnic minorities, the 30 that took it, have all got a promotion. You know, a lot of them did. So that was great. But there's a lot more to it than that. Are, have you seen some of them have improvements in their kind of career conversations? Have we seen some of them have a change in growth mindset? Have their personal development plans got better? Are they, have their in, individual networks grown? Has their kind of wider networks and external networks grown? Are they getting more kind of exposure to senior leaders and stuff like that? There's, there's a number of sort of lesser tangible results that kind of help you to understand whether the program was successful and by kind of running through those things you kind of get to a place where you go yeah that was a really successful program and it didn't ruffle too many feathers because when you go into your bank and say i want to do a program that's just for ethnic minorities that can ruffle feathers um in some companies but it didn't and we've seen only positivity come from it which is good and you know what for some people it made them realize that this wasn't the place for them as well so right. yeah final question here i've got is um, from elizabeth um ED&I um, versus race. Um, people often just don't want to fo focus on race. And we can often know actually race can be the poor cousin, you know, apart from the EDI mix. How, how, do, how is that addressed? You can take that one first, Raj. Yeah, I just think that, that's stupid, isn't it? I mean, how can you talk about, how can people now in this day and age with all the pressures on organisations and big organisations being seen as in a glass box and depending where you are, in society, you're looking at that glass box from a different angle. So I think any organisation who's still in that space where they think that race is in conflict with other diversity initiatives is, is just not well set up. And people should think very carefully about whether that's the right culture they want to work in. I'd also, I'd also say that some of the reasons that people think race is a problem is because it's still uncomfortable for them. Regardless of everything that happened in 2020, people still find it uncomfortable. That's why we're running our allyship program. That's like, you know, let's get comfortable with the uncomfortable things. Let's start removing the taboo of talking about race. You can call somebody black. That's okay. You can ask somebody how to say their name if you're scared of pronouncing it wrong. That's okay. And when you start to move some of those taboos from race, it's not difficult then to have conversations about race when you think about equality and diversity. Fantastic. So I appreciate the time. There are a few other questions there which are interesting. So what we'll do is we'll throw them questions into the um, uh, the guild so we can get the content together, including, you know, changing the name from BAME, et cetera, and how do you get um, um, personal data from, you know, people um, declaring their, um, their, their protected characteristics in, in, in data. So um, please join the guild um, to carry on this conversation. Um, I'll hand you back to Raj to wrap up. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I hope you found that whistle-stop tour um, I thought the things you wanted inspiring well I couldn't promise that but I'm sure we have collaborated and if you use the socials as a good opportunity for network thank you ever so much for uh, Dr Carl who couldn't be with us and uh, our other speaker Ugo I thought that was great you know learned a lot about virgin money and um, and what they're trying to do uh, and it's nice to see an organization that's taking little steps forward as opposed to you know I was watching the telly last night in Royal London you know one of the these diverse insurance companies are in their advert starts with we're an insurance company really serious about diversity. So you couldn't even imagine that a year ago, could you? So it's part of who we are and part of the people we want in this group and network is people who actually want to make their organizations accountable for turning actions into words. So thank you for the time that you've invested with us today. I learned a lot. I hope, hope you all else did. Um, and, you know, stick with us, get behind Race Equality Week, um, you know, join up with us on socials and like see if we can learn from each other and make a change because we haven't got an opportunity or a um, chance to ignore it. It's part of who we are. <laughs>